Malagwa and Cooper 3 present Tar Virus Chapter 1 The whole planet trembled the moment it happened eight years ago. I was just nine when it happened, but it was enough to deeply scare me. A meteor struck Africa, and there was nothing modern science could do about it. People thought it was the end of the line for Earth. Yet, at the moment of impact, only a crater and mild quakes were the end result. For a second, the Earth sighed as the so-called doomsday turned out to be a pebble the size of a truck crashing in the middle of the western shoreline of Africa. The world was relieved and soon after things returned back to normal. Well, sort of. There was a huge ongoing investigation of the crater as well as of the meteor's remains, but there was no way it would affect us. Or, so we thought. It made itself present months later around the continent, as an odd disease started appearing. It wasn't life-threatening so far, merely some fever, raspy voice, stomach ache, among other symptoms. The CDC confirmed that there was a link between the sickness and the dust that came out of the meteor. But what sent the world into chaos was when the first victim, some Egyptian librarian, started mutating at work. The change was described as gruesome and unnatural. The end result was his body became animal-like. I mean, he grew furry, gained hooves, and his face pushed out into a muzzle. But that wasn't at all. He grew two legs from his torso, as well as a tail, and in a matter of minutes, he was what could have been described as a centaur, but with a horse-like torso. The new creature sent the world into panic, which amplified as more and more people changed, each one changing into a different animal. People were scared, starting to quarantine and isolate every changee, tar as some communities on the internet dubbed them. That was until the horse tar, the first one that changed, reverted painfully a couple days later, and just afterwards, more outbreaks were detected around those who had changed back. It was discovered that upon changing back, the virus manifested itself in boils in the back of the person, and upon bursting, it transmitted through the air. It's been eight years since then, and the world has begun to grow used to, very slowly, the virus. No cure has been found, not even a way to reduce its effects. The only protection that was found was prevention, to have the shield raised before it attacked. That meant many people, about 70-80%, to 80 became neat freaks that wouldn't even touch the food without spraying pure all on it first. Well, eh, I'm exaggerating. A bit. But the world became uber clean to avoid contagion and becoming freaks. Of course, the government tried to reincorporate them into society, which was hard as they were treated as outcasts, and even feared or attacked. They were provided with stores that possessed various items from tests to measure the time of the transformation to custom-made clothing. Still nowadays, some people are afraid and worried of contracting the virus, despite it getting used to the TARS. The paranoia reached its peak when the virus adapted, becoming harder to know who was infected, and harder to prevent. The strong warning symptoms either got toned down, or ticked in hours or minutes before the change. The only thing that saved the world from purging, or going crazy, was that the effects were temporary, lasting minimum 5 days to 3 years, longest so far. My name is Marcus Finway and I belong to that small percentage that nowadays is considered paranoid. Yet, yeah, I'm proud to say that I and my family have been tar-free ever since the first outbreak started. How? By being extra cautious. My mom and dad educated us, my brother and I, to be really clean. That means we take care of everything we touch and use. Clothes are washed twice, latex gloves become mandatory while outside. My family was even in a bit of an anti-tar position. My dad criticized and joked about them, while my mom ran a campaign in the school to have them banned in order to avoid exposing other students. People called them extremists, and to be honest, it was starting to get old. I mean, almost all the school had been a tar at least once or more, and with my parents pressing me to befriend the ones that were still virus-free, my circle of friendships reduced dramatically over these eight years. I was starting to get tired of this. I mean, we couldn't run away from this forever and criticize those who are or have been a tar. Well, that's about it for my life. 
Now you know what I have to deal with every day. The critics by my friends. Lectures about cleanliness. The scenes I have to go through as my parents struggle against the TARS. I just hope it changes soon. Marcus, wake up! We'll be late, said my mother from the hallway, bringing me back to the land of the awake. I was turning a bit in my sleep. For my parents to teach a ten-year-old about extensive cleaning had to force discipline, an aspect I didn't enjoy. Glancing at the clock, I noticed it was 6 a.m. Today was Tuesday. Extra laundry day. I groaned as I had to wake up early to help my mom with my older brother, Trevor. I sighed and checked around my room, the classic teenager room. Not too big, but still not really small. Looking at my TV, I considered turning it on for a second, but I'd probably get chastised from my mom for doing that. Defeated by chores, I stood up on the carpeted, clean, smooth floor, putting on the disposable latex gloves, and opened the dirty laundry hamper, taking out all the jeans and shirts that could possibly have come in contact with the virus, and headed out to do the laundry. After some extensive, yet a bit unnecessary extra caution with the laundry and some simple breakfast, I was off to high school. Trevor, being the oldest, and assisting sophomore year at a nearby college, had the rights to use the third car, meaning Mom had to drive me to school. It was a bit of a drag I had to endure, especially as she commented that we were very fortunate for not going through a tar vacation. Not even once. I barely listened. I was feeling a bit lightheaded from time to time. I guessed I must have come down with something. I would rather have thought that they would assume that I was coming down with the virus and have me sealed in a plastic bubble. I exited and headed towards the school. The sight was normal. Lots of students walking into classes, some in the lockers, one or another tar strolling down the hallway, normal. I avoided at all costs those tars. Not because I hated them, but I was beginning to fear getting the virus. That pattern led me to behave as an antisocial to almost anyone. I simply hoped this price for being pure was worth it because I was beginning to get tired of it. The first class was math, and it was the one I tried to avoid the most. Not because of the math, but because of the teacher. Miss Hawthorne was a tar, a wolf one. She contracted the virus about a year ago, almost at the same time she started working in the school. Supposedly she claimed that she got a 26 month strain, though rumor has it that she got a permanent version of the strain instead. Anyway, most of the people agreed that she looked nice in her tar form. People commented that the gray fur on her and her muzzle gave her 30 year old body exotic looks. <laughs> I'll agree with them in that, but that doesn't mean I'll want a person who has three halves animal to get near me. In her class, it was a bit of a pain to keep distance from her. I usually sat in the back of the class, and when she needed to talk to me, I would usually keep my distance or try to cover my mouth. She noticed this, and at first tried to contact and talk to me. I evaded and closed myself, even threatened to complain with the school board for trying to infect me. In the end, she stopped trying and kept distance. I know that I may have sounded like I'm an ass, but I was just trying to look after myself. Anyway, class went as usual. I was having a bit of a hard time concentrating as I was dealing with a bit of a mild stomach pain. Still, I managed to solve the problems at the same time. Things were a bit easy, though I had to force my sight to manage to read the board properly. After class, I got called by Miss Hawthorne. I sighed. What was she going to try to do now? Once everyone left, I was alone with Miss Hawthorne. She looked at me from behind the desk as I kept my distance and placed the papers from the homework in her bag. Taking off her custom-made glasses, she sighed and commented. Seems that you remain in your extreme position against TARS, she said as I nodded cautiously. I'm just cautious. I don't want to end up as... <sighs> but I trailed off. I realized I was speaking ill to a teacher. Not actually meaning it, but I guess my parents' influence was what drove me to say that. She sighed again and reached into her blouse to pull out a folded paper. Well, as much as I would like to help you understand that we are people, I've been asked to inform you that the teacher of the Cross Country's after-school group you assist, Coach Jameson, has taken the week off for personal reason, and I have been asked to fill in for him for the next week while he's away. 
So I expect you to behave and a bit of tolerance from you. I'll brief your teammates later when I get the chance. I wanted to protest, but it was something that was out of my reach. The principal or directives wouldn't accept a switch just because I plainly disliked Tars and those who had been one not long ago. I simply nodded and headed off. I was going to have a hard time in the after school activities. I was beginning to think of skipping or getting an excuse for it. I was in the cross country team of the school. I recall joining the team years ago. Even after the meteor incident, this was something I kept doing even though it meant exposing me more to the outside world. Even there, I had a limited number of friends. When I started, I met three students that were in my year. Trish Humes, Josh Parker, and Paul Stevens. But things changed a bit over time. Josh and Trish got infected by the tar virus. The former got stuck as an ermine tar for a week about a year ago, while the latter changed five times by now all those times into a Mustang tar. Trish's constant transformations made us move apart, as every time I tried to re-establish contact, she would eventually change back months later. Now that I recall, it's been about two months since she changed back from her last infection, and I haven't directed a word at her. A couple of classes later, I was having PE class. The sport this day was baseball. I suck today. My focus vanished from time to time while I was giving it my all. Even when I managed to get to first base, I started feeling some fatigue. And by the time they got me out of the field before reaching home, I felt exhausted. So much I staggered upon reaching the bench and ha having me trip on it, earning some laughs from everybody. After that, there was a small break for lunch. As I headed into the cafeteria, Paul joined me. He was an average student wearing glasses, curly but short hair, not much of a sports person, but trying to keep up with the rest of the team. He talked to me as I poked at the cafeteria food. That was a bit of a misstep back there in physical education class, he commented, chuckling a bit as he sat down. Yeah, I started feeling exhausted all of a sudden, I commented as I took a bite of the food. You probably contracted something, a flu maybe, he commented, as another boy arrived. He was Steve, another student of school. He belonged to a bit of a small group of non-tars so far, and his parents were really close to mine. So, I think you can guess what his position about the infection was. Yo, Fenway! Is that your performance in the field today? Heh. <laughs> you looked as a tar trying to walk on its hind legs, he laughed a bit. I didn't take his sense of humor most of the time. It was a bit of my father's taste. Dude, that really wasn't funny, answered Paul in my steed. Come on, I was just having my fun. I've actually seen one of those beasts attempt to walk on two legs. It's hilarious. Steve laughed some more. No, I don't think it is, commented a girl approaching the table. It was Trish, one of the members of the team and a friend, if she could still be considered one. She was really cute and nice. I considered asking her out about five years ago before she got infected by the first time. She had nice long brown hair that cascaded over her shoulders and back. While her face was actually really cute, it was a pity people considered infectious. She still stood in her simple t-shirt, jeans, arms crossed, looking at Steve as if he had no shame. Huh, well, if it isn't the pony girl, Steve said, taking a couple steps back. Any plans wearing a saddle? I'm guessing they'll be changing over the next few days. Trish grinned. Maybe, but I could use some company, she said, approaching Steve, who had never been infected before, and backed away even more. Ha! Funny. I know you're not contagious, but I don't intend someone as virus prone as you getting near me, he said, backing away and leaving. Trish smiled as she sat down on the other side of the table. Hey Marcus, how are you? she asked, trying to get closer. I was conflicted. So far I've tried to avoid her, as I did believe Steve was right and she was virus prone. Also, I was now struggling against the stomach ache, which was stronger. Still not talking, eh? She sighed really sad in disappointment. I thought you would have... Marcus, are you okay? She approached me. I'm fine, I said while scratching the base of my neck. To my surprise, she moved fast and placed her hand on my shoulder while feeling my forehead. Marcus, you have a fever. I couldn't say anything. I was a bit surprised at the warmness of her touch. She looked a tad worried and quickly stretched the neck of the t-shirt and gasped. 
You have a rash. It all happened so fast. She called in a teacher and muttered something to him. The next thing I knew, I was carried to the infirmary and got expected by the old nurse. Then she said it. You have the tar virus. I was shocked and went into denial. No, that's not possible. I can't. There was no way. I said at first, but she paid me no attention as she started calling my mom to pick me up. Luckily, she didn't mention anything about the virus. I was scared of how they might have reacted. I spent the whole time trying to deny it and was already going to anger. By the time my mother arrived, I was going into negotiation. I was calmer and was able to hide the truth, a bit afraid my mother would find out, and even more how my family would treat me. Would they kick me out of the house? No. I didn't think that it was a five day strain. A week? Two tops? It couldn't be that bad. I hoped. On the ride home, it was expected, she asked. What happened, Marcus? The nurse said it was important. I started coughing. Here I had the chance to say the truth, but out of fear I chose to lie. I'm just having a, a stomach ache. I actually didn't know why I lied. I guess I was afraid of telling my parents the truth. Yet she seemed to buy it. I reached home moments later, muffling my coughs. I wasn't sure whether to be relieved or worried I was at home. But everything was swept by as I rushed into the bathroom to puke. Something that worried my mom. I felt horrible. I mean, aside from the symptoms and the sickness, I feared what would happen to me. I would have turned into what I tried to avoid, and my family loathed and feared. I sighed. Things were going to get harder. Standing up, I looked at my reflection in the mirror. My medium-length black hair messed from the sprint and throwing up. Still, I gave myself a worried look. I was still the same, looking a bit sick, but still the same me. I was a bit on the average build, not looking overly fit, but doing my best to not be a slob. I glanced at my green eyes that had started to look brighter. Approaching to take a closer look, I saw my pupils had become slitted. I backed away, scared. It was happening now! I rushed upstairs to my bedroom, passing my mom the way, who asked what was happening. Upon entering, I locked the door. The minute the door closed, I started feeling all the symptoms get worse. My stomach started hurting, and my sight lost focus for a second. I rolled on the floor, feeling the itch I had been feeling since I left home get worse. I simply writhed as it started to become more like a burn. I groaned and managed to listen from the other side of the door when my mom called me. I called your dad so he can come take you to the doctor so he can prescribe you something. Just what I needed. I writhed around as the burn regressed into an itch. Glancing at my arms, I saw white fur start to grow on them. I was scared and caught a sight of my hands as paw pads appeared. No, please! This has to be a dream! Please! I muttered as my nail cracked as sharp claws grew under them. I was about to try to stand up when my stomach hurt as hell. I gasped as two bulges painfully began to appear on top of my pelvis. I knew what those two would come to be. While well, every inch added was caused by my body producing an extra vertebrae. My shoes were becoming loose fitting as my feet lengthened and heels slipped from my footwear. Foolishly, I tried to push the two bumps back into my body, only giving myself more pain as they became articulate and started twitching. I moaned as I saw my face push out into a feline muzzle. A white one. I could also tell that my ears had just moved upwards, as they were twitching at every sound that came from me. Rolling on my sides, I tried to stand up, but my body was far longer and my spine was beginning to arch painfully as a second pelvic bone started to form near my forming forelegs, which were about the size of a human forearm, were beginning to gain paws in the end. I tried to stand or get into a sitting position, but my still developing leg only managed to kick the ground. I didn't really know how to control them yet. Using my hands to help myself, I would have managed to put myself on my belly, but before I managed it, a couple of changes stopped me from doing so. I started feeling a wave of dizziness and falling short of breath as my new body started to demand more blood flow and air. A loud rip as well as an ugly sting of pain had me see that I'd grown a long slender tail which sprouted from above my butt, splitting my pants. 
while my thighs gained a bit of bulk, helping me turn my pants into shreds. My backside, my tar half, now started to grow black fur while my belly and paws gained white fur. I was turning into a cat tar! I gasped as the air wasn't enough and began to fade as I leaned against my bed as my forelegs finished developing. I felt the final changes taking place. My fur grew more, giving me a fluffier appearance. Six stings in my face, above my muzzle, and new sensitivity told me that I'd just grown whiskers. I looked behind as my body seemed to finish changing. Seconds later, I started feeling better, as I felt my lungs grow in size and my heart become strong enough to easily pump blood into my new body. That was all. I was a tar. I was feeling better, physically, as all the sickness, fever, and pain vanished. On the downside, though, I was a tar. A freak. My parents are going to kill me, and school will be hell. And almost in response to that thought, the door was unlocked, and my parents came in. Mom let out a scream, while Dad looked really mad. Thank you for joining me for Chapter 1 of Tar Virus. Be sure to go on lulu.com and check out the full book. You can also view this story on DeviantArt. Links will be provided in the description down below. We hope you have enjoyed this, and stay tuned for Chapter 2.